coconut one sure hits the spot. Before he was given up to death, a death he freely accepted, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body which will be given up for you. Come on, what's keeping him? You'd think he'd get himself another pickup. That heat breaks down more than my old lady at a wake. He's hung around the motor pool so long, maybe he fancies himself a mechanic. Man, I'm still hungry. Why is it always me? McKinney drives right by this place. He could have picked them up this time. Eh, what's the rush? You're late, you're late. Chapman's okay. As long as he doesn't bring his mutt. When supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and praise. Gave the cup to his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all men, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Seven thirty. Did I get here early or did I get here early? The mass is ended. Go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Better save this for the pooch, just in case. Good morning, thank you. Good morning, thank you. Eva, Eva, your sister Minnie looks wonderful. As a matter of fact, she even lit into me for being late at the hospital. She likes you. You know, she told me she was so glad it was you who brought her Holy Communion and said the Father Carmen. See, he's no grouch, she now, said. Now. Well, he scolded Minnie for gossiping so much. That's why she doesn't like him. <laughs> Say, did I tell you what... Eva, her... Eva, I would love to chat with you a while longer, but... You got army the, this weekend? I'm afraid so. And if I'm late today, they're going to court-martial me for mm -hmm. sure. Now listen, you tell Minnie I'll be at the hospital 7 o'clock Monday I morning, Sean. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Bye. Bye-bye. Now, nary a drop. I hope you don't mind frosted donuts. No, Fina, I love them. Say, this is awful thoughtful of you. Especially me keeping you waiting all this while. Hey, what kind of engine do you have in this machine? It's a 390, four barrel dual exhaust. Hey, you pooch, I got something for you too. Yeah, you're gonna spoil it. What's wrong with your machine? Uh, I got a leak in the brake lining. I noticed it yesterday when I was taking up the free play in the clutch. Had hydraulic fluid all over the ground. Oh, incidentally, about a mile, mile and a half down the road, there's a little house on the right. I want to drop the dog off there. Right. Say, how's your dog? That's what I wanted to ask you. How's he doing? Uh, I don't know. Still struggling. Uh, 40, 60, 60, 40, you might say. He, uh, he short tied one on last weekend. See, I'm sorry to hear that. You know, it, it's such. You did your best. You tried stopping by, speaking to him like you did after my mother died. Well, maybe there's something more we can do, Pina. Maybe we can go all out. Well, you know, she always kept him in line. I, I mean, sure, he drank, but not, not like this. Not swallowing in self-pity the way he does now. Well, maybe you and I could persuade him to get help. I mean, real help. You know, the AA is a great organization. Sure. 
trying to fit everything in, it's a problem. There never seems to be enough time. You rush around a lot. It's demanding. <laughs> People ask, where do I find time to fit this all in, uh, being a full-time parish priest and a chaplain in the reserves? Well, it isn't easy, but it can be done. And it can be done, I feel, without neglecting one's duty to his parish. It's a matter of economizing your time, setting priorities, tight scheduling. That's the important thing. But there's a lot of flexibility in a reserve chaplaincy, too. Like, if you're late for a meeting, or if your church duties prevent you from getting to a training session, well, you can make it up. And most of the time, on, on your own time, and in your own way. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up to you. Is it worth stretching myself out like this? Well, to me it is, because I believe what I'm doing is really important to my church and to my country. I, I'm using this extra time to extend my ministry, to reach out to that unique group of citizen soldiers, civilians like myself, people who would be among the first to go if war broke out, their lives disrupted, their courage and faith put to the severest test. And I'm pledged to be right there with them, to be their spiritual advisor, to bring the testimony of religious faith into their lives at a very time when their lives hang in the balance. To me, it's a calling that no clergyman need apologize for. Now, where in the world can we get bendies like this, fellas, hmm? Saudi Arabia. <laughs> I think I'll do better than that. <laughs> You know what I wanted to talk to you about? Mill has been looking really down the last couple of weeks, and I see he's been missing a couple of meetings. Is there anything that you know about that might be wrong? Uh, yes, sir. He uh, called uh, the uh, company here last week and said uh, he's having problems with his wife. Uh, Listen, if you have any problems or anything, you just look me up. I'm going to get back to headquarters, okay? stimulating working with these guys. They're in their prime, they're dedicated. It's like working with a special youth ministry. And it gives me the golden opportunity to get through to some guys that I'd never see in my pew on a Sunday morning. That's real satisfaction for me. It's a dual ministry, really. And I'm caught up in it. Let us turn to responsive reading 82, The New Birth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. There was a man named Jesus, and he told stories a long time ago that we still tell today. And this is a story he told about a man and his family. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Getting through to people, and communicating any way you can, helping people to cope, to see themselves and their problems clearly. Spreading the word. Brothers and sisters, faith in Jesus can set you free. And I don't hesitate to take that word of Jesus to the city streets. I 
Reverend Green. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Okay. Good to see you in church this morning. Thank you. Good to see you also. Uh, Miss Tom, though, how is he? Yeah, he's coming along. He's still in the hospital. Mm -hmm. How was the operation? The operation was a success. He's still in a bit of pain, though. Yeah, well, you tell him I'm sorry I haven't seen him uh, till now, but I'll be up this week for sure. And you and your brother getting, all, getting along a little bit better at home? Yeah. Uh, I like to hear that now. And what's the best thing you like about church? Oh, you meet a lot of people. You have to relate to people as they really are. Uh, knowing people, letting people get to know you, that's one-on-one -on -one contact, and I like that. If Jesus was never too tired to, or too busy to talk to people as individuals, why should I? That's why I became a chaplain in the Army Reserve. The opportunity for one-on-one -on -one contact. Newest truck the Army has. Heavy equipment transport. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying, Chaplain. The woman just doesn't understand how it is, or doesn't want to understand. You think I was fooling around or something. Last week she says, listen, baby, it's me or the reserves. Why should I quit the reserves? Well, if you talk to your wife more about the work you do here and why, she might not feel shortchanged by you. She thinks I joined up just to get away from her and the kids. And you know something, Chaplain? She's half right. If I stop by and talk to her about my experience in the reserve, it might help her to relate to you a little better. That sounds good, Chaplain. I, I would look forward to that. How you guys doing? Hello, Chaplain. How you doing? Fine, fine. Good. It's raining a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's a weekend. Can you give me a hand? I appreciate that. There you go. Working with these young soldiers can be very rewarding. Once you've gained their confidence and you've built up that bond of trust, they open up. And you can do something with that, even if it's just to listen. But most of the time, there's a lot more to do than that. Baruch atah Adonai noten ha-Torah Amen Vovo l'Adonai minchas yedo v'rosh Elohim Ki me'ola mukhshonim kadmoniyos And from the depths of their affliction, the martyrs lifted their voices in a song of faith in the coming of the messianic age, when justice and brotherhood will reign among men. Oh, that they would enter into my prayer. Then would I fully open my heart in prayer, supplication, and holy speech. Then, O oh God, would I pour out the words of my heart before your presence. May he who causes peace to reign in the high heavens let peace descend on us on all Israel and all the world. Shabbat Shalom. I'm very glad that you were able to come to surfaces this Friday. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Oh, thank you. It's always a pleasure to see your face there. Yeah, I hope I'll be able to come more often. Oh, so do I. Oh, sure. There are many in my synagogue who wonder why their rabbi serves in the National Guard. It's a real mystery to some of them. What does a rabbi do in the National Guard, they ask? Well, I tell them I, I do what other rabbis do. I teach, I conduct services, I counsel, I visit the sick. The only difference is once a month I do it in Army Green. How are you, David? Pretty good. Uh, stomach's finally settled down, and, and, but my mouth is still kind of dry. I think it's the drugs have given me. But, but how are you? Well, getting pretty depressed. I, I get real stir-crazy in a place like this. And, you know, I got my wife at home that's... I'm not taking any money in, you know. I'm, I can't get to my job. You're sitting here doing nothing. Just drive me crazy. Total readiness. That's the buzzword around here. The National Guard chaplain has to be ready just like everyone else. Okay, over here is the minefield. They have to go through it, find the mines, mark them. So the next team can come in and uh, find, take them up and reset them. Mm -hmm. You have to be physically, spiritually, and professionally prepared for mobilization. That's the commitment that I've made to my country and to these soldiers. It takes about two hours. Chaplain, this is the M47 Dragon anti-tank missile. Mm -hmm. It is one of the Army's most effective weapons against tanks. Everything has to be planned for and worked out ahead of time. So you study your unit's mobilization plans and standing operating procedures, and then you design and develop your own program for meeting the spiritual and human needs of your men in the event of a call-up. 
Has this been checked for leakage? Yes, sir. How exactly do you do that? Well, after you have get the man. Another thing you do is secure and organize all your military equipment. Clothing, books and regulations, religious materials, chaplain's kit, blanket, tents, cots, everything necessary to be effective in the field if your unit is called to duty. It's a good idea to inventory this stuff now and then, and you should have your personal gear and supplies packed and ready to go. In order to be effective, truly effective, a National Guard chaplain has to grow steadily in his knowledge of how the Army operates, its command structures, technical channels of communications, the whys and wherefores. Sometimes that means that you burn the midnight oil. Extension courses are available, and you can take advanced training at chaplain schools and other Army schools. You can't possibly hope to do all this without a deep personal commitment, a belief that what you're doing really counts. M16, M203, what is it all about, Chaplain? Well, I can tell you what the scripture has to say about it, but the most important thing is how you feel about it. How do you feel about it? Well, the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. I feel like I got a job to do. I was assigned this job, so I'm going to pursue that. I'm available. I'm professionally prepared. Call me if you need me. That, in effect, is what you're saying to your country when you join the National Guard. It's a voluntary thing. You do it because you want to and because you're needed there. Don't think this is all noble self-sacrifice on my part. The adventure of being out there with the troops, excitement of roughing it for a weekend every once in a while, I'm attracted to that. The camaraderie, the lasting friendship. Some people may question the morality of any clergyman in military garb, but I honestly believe my presence doesn't imply any endorsement of war or any national policy. I'm there because my parishioners are there. You know, they may not think about it now, but if a real crisis should occur, and I pray one never will, I'm the one they would come to for help in personal matters, for solace and spiritual guidance, because their lives are going to be severely disrupted and threatened. And I believe I can be of great service to them in a crisis situation. Right off, you realize that these men suffer the same afflictions as any other member of the parish. The deep hurts, the false values, doubts about the faith, alcoholism, troubled children. Hey, Robert. How are you doing, Chaplain? I picked this up, thought you might like to take a look at it. PET, Parent Effectiveness Training. Do you think it'll help? Well, give it a try. Thanks, Chaplain. I'm really beginning to get to them now, just being out there with them in the same uniform, the barriers start coming down. I'm growing, too. My communication skills are getting better. I think I'm beginning to understand the human condition a little better, just being with them. They're honest. Well, you guys call me down here to bless this mess, huh? Oh, yes, Captain Green. How are you? Well, just fine. And you? Fine, thank you. We're watching and observing this young lady here prepare the new meal. Well, and, uh, at least we're in good shape. We have a clerk who can cook. How long has this been going on? Um, about a month, two months now. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't want to get anyone in any trouble or anything, but it's just beginning to interfere with my job. Mm -hmm. Well, you're taking a positive step coming to talk to me and get these feelings out in the open. You feel better now? A few months ago, I managed to get a few of the fathers together in my unit for a meeting. And we had a very serious discussion about um, religion in modern life, the problems of raising children, marriage, divorce, the single parent, it was wonderful. So now we formed a discussion group and we meet whenever we can. Uh, no topic is taboo. And right now I've begun to introduce them to TA, transactional analysis. I know it sounds heavy, but the concepts are very simple. It's a practical way for them to get in touch with their feelings, the fears, the angers, and to begin the healing process. And uh, their response has been very enthusiastic. Let the glory of God be extolled. Let his great name be hallowed in the world whose creation he willed. May his kingdom soon prevail in our own day, our own lives, and the life of all Israel. And let us say amen. Let his great name be... One weekend a month. Two weeks during annual training. That doesn't provide much opportunity for ministering in the conventional sense. Still, you'll be surprised at how many opportunities you'll have to teach on weekends and during annual training. And by and large, you'll have excellent support from your staff officers and commanders in providing time for worship. Thank you all for joining in this Sunday service. Well, I'm having trouble about making my meat properly like I should now. 
I'm having trouble at home mm -hmm. and on my job about getting off bed and coming here and making it on time. Well, uh, let, let's talk specifically. What exactly are the problems that you're encountering at work? If you take the attitude that you're going to reach these guys any way that you can, if you join in your unit's activities, then you'll find real fulfillment in your National Guard chaplaincy. You'll have full reign for your initiative. You can be as innovative with your congregation as your imagination and your energy allow. How are you doing, guys? Just fine, sir. Good. Not all situations warrant crisis intervention. Right. It could be a simple matter of a guy not knowing how to make friends or, or keep friends, and, and he doesn't know why. He could be as awkward as a kid in summer camp. So it's up to us to bring him out of his isolation, to promote growth, self-esteem. That's the important thing, to get him out of his awkwardness. You guys will be getting off pretty soon. I have to swell. How are we doing, okay? <laughs> sure. To look at them, you, you wouldn't think that they wanted to talk about anything spiritual, but they do, many do. So you go to them. Just being there with them, you're carrying out the greatest tradition of the Army chaplaincy. You're following in the footsteps of some great spiritual leaders. The year, 1775. The place, Bunker Hill. Chaplain David Avery braves the withering fire of advancing British infantry to quench the physical and spiritual thirst of dying militiamen. 1778, Valley Forge. Chaplain Israel Evans suffers and prays with the Continental Army in its darkest hour. 1863, Gettysburg, the second day of battle. Under a hail of fire, Chaplain Corby ministers the last rites to the dying soldiers of the Irish Brigade. 1943, the troop ship Dorchester gored by torpedoes, sinks below the frigid waters of the North Atlantic. On board are four United States Army chaplains, two Protestants, a Catholic priest, and a Jewish rabbi. All of them give away their own life jackets and go down with the ship. Their heroic sacrifice, like the sacrifices of chaplains in the Korean War and Vietnam, have left a legacy richly studded with examples of great personal courage and devotion to duty. This legacy inspired men and women to become chaplain candidates. Most of the training they'll receive for the chaplaincy takes place here, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, home of the United States Army Chaplain School. Whether you're a candidate for the active Army Chaplaincy, the Army Reserve, or the National Guard, this is where you'll come to take a rigorous training program in basic military subjects. Now, don't worry. You're not going to be taught how to fire machine guns or toss hand grenades. But you will be taught how to integrate religious teachings, ethics, morals into the life of the soldier. How to talk to and counsel with today's breed of soldier. And how to work effectively within the military system. It's a demanding program. But before I tell you how to get in it, let me make a few important points clear. As a chaplain, you're not required to bear arms. You know that. But you should also know that you're not going to be told what to preach or how to preach. There's no official army way of conducting services or providing pastoral care. You'll be free to conduct services according to the dictates of your conscience and the teachings of your church. Although you'll be a commissioned officer holding rank with pay to match, you will always be referred to by the men you serve as chaplain, whether you're a first lieutenant or general. And if your unit is called up during a national emergency, you may be ordered to active duty. That's the bottom line of the commitment you'll be making if you join the Army Reserves. Now, as for the required qualifications, to be eligible, you must be under 33 years of age at the time of your appointment and able to pass a standard physical. Your educational credentials should include 120 semester hours of credit plus a master's of divinity degree or its equivalent. You must be regularly ordained and actively engaged in the practice of the ministry as your principal vocation in life. Equally important, you must have the endorsement for the chaplaincy 
by a recognized religious denomination. This ecclesiastical endorsement is a simple written statement that you, the applicant, have the approval of your church to become a reserve army chaplain. Now, for those of you who are still seminarians with a genuine interest in the chaplaincy, here's good news. You don't have to wait to be fully ordained to apply. The Army has an attractive option for seminarians. It's called the Chaplain Candidate Program, sort of an ROTC for chaplain candidates. You'll wear the insignia of a chaplain candidate. Only later will you wear the cross or tablets. You'll undergo six weeks of intensive instruction at the Army Chaplain School. This basic officer's course is given in the summer. And while training, you'll receive full pay and allowances. Oh, incidentally, at this point in your training, you'll be addressed as lieutenant, not chaplain. That comes later. After completing the basic course, you can apply for additional training, say as a part-time assistant to a chaplain in a reserve unit near you, or in a selective studies program, or a self-improvement reading course to help deepen your knowledge of the chaplaincy. Upon your graduation, ordination, and with the endorsement of your church, you'll be commissioned a chaplain in the Army Reserves or the Army National Guard. Now, it's important to remember that during a national emergency, you could be called to active duty, although not without the approval of your church's superiors. As for your assignment, most of you will serve with a unit nearest you. Sometimes there's one in your own community. You'll be required to participate in monthly training assemblies plus two weeks of annual training at an active Army installation. Oh, by the way, as a chaplain, you'll be allowed sufficient free time during weekend training to conduct services in your own parish at the regular times. Oh, by the way, you get paid. And the pay is better than you might expect. For instance, because there are four drill periods in every training weekend, and you get one full day's pay for each drill period, that works out to four full days' pay for one weekend's worth of work. That's something to think about. And so are these other attractive benefits, such as retirement pay at age 60 for those with 20 years of qualifying service, and low-cost life insurance, and shopping privileges at the post exchange. One day's privilege for every eight-hour training period. Your spouse and dependent children can accompany you. You get commissary privileges, too, during your two weeks of annual training. When you're on active duty, you and your family can participate in all the activities of the officers' club. There's much more, of course. Survivors and medical coverage, uniform allowances, travel. Some units even take their summer training in Europe. You'll find that while you're on active duty, the chapels you will use are well-constructed and beautiful. There are educational opportunities, too, to help advance your careers and earn promotions. So the inducements are there. But by far, the one that counts the most is your sincere desire to extend your civilian ministries into the dynamic world of the Army Reservist. These dedicated men and women are carrying more than their share of the burden of national defense. The need for chaplains of all faiths to serve has never been greater. This is an Army Reserve Training Center. There are a thousand like it throughout the United States. And here they come. America's citizen soldiers, volunteers all, men and women who have put aside their civilian cares one weekend a month to do what's been described as the most important part-time job in America today. They're reservists, and they've come to train and prepare to maintain their proficiency and skills that would be sorely needed in event of a national emergency. Working right along with the infantrymen, the radio operators, the medics, and the engineers, our priests, rabbis, and ministers, men and women of the cloth, full-time civilian clergy who are volunteer chaplains in the reserves. They live double lives, and as chief of army chaplains, I am particularly proud of the fine job they're doing, proud of the extra effort they're making to fill the religious and pastoral needs of their fellow reservists. It's a big responsibility. For never before have our reserves been so important to our national security. With today's much leaner active army, the role of the reservist has grown in importance, and so has the need for providing adequate religious leadership for our reserve forces. 
Currently, we are burdened by a serious shortage of reserve chaplains. We need your help. We especially need more Catholic priests and ethnic ministers in the program. Here you have the opportunity to extend your ministry part-time into the Army Reserve environment while continuing to fulfill your duties to your local parish. I appeal to you all, pastors, church leaders, seminarians, to do what you can to help us relieve this shortage of chaplains in the reserve components. When you think of the responsibility these dedicated Americans are shouldering, of their commitment and sacrifice, can we of the cloth be satisfied doing less? Dare we take the chance of these men going into battle someday with everything except the spiritual and moral guidance only you can provide? The decision is yours. <laughs>